Hi Ali, this is Igor Smirnov here, and it's great to talk to you. Hi, it's my pleasure to see you, to hear you, and I'm really happy. Alright, so you wrote me an email and uh, let me know a little bit about you. As far as I understand, you are at 2100 rating level and at the same time there are some issues that you have and you would like to overcome them and to keep progressing further. But before we move on to analyzing your games as well, the ones that you sent me, let me just quickly ask you in general about your chess progress. How did you progress to this level? It's pretty high level. A lot of players can never achieve this even during their lifetime. So how could you progress up to this level? Yes, it's mainly because of the uh, thought process which you gave me in your courses. I get uh, started with your courses and uh, it was really fantastic. And I read a uh, lots of books about chess and many rules, many uh, different topics, and uh, but no system, no discipline. And yeah, I couldn't apply them in my games, but when I found you uh, and I uh, trained my own thinking system, then it's, it's, uh, it becomes much easier for me to make progress in chess and improvement. Oh, nice, nice. I'm happy to know that my courses were useful. And um, which one did you like the most? Uh, mostly a calculation, calculate till mate. Oh, that's, that's nice. That's also and a little bit actually, more advanced course, yeah. All of them was great, I should say, honestly, all of them. I see a lot of material about chess, but your, your courses are the best, I think, in my opinion. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> you are generous in your estimation, but I'm happy to know that it was helpful for you, and indeed your results prove that. Yeah. All right, let's first see one of your games, and then we'll uh, continue discussing um, the questions that you have and uh, the other things that you wanted to check with me. Is that okay? Yeah. All right, so here's the first game. You're playing white. Yes. By the way, I checked uh, briefly the games that you sent me, and I see that you play in these uh, attacking openings, which is good. Definitely, it beats your style. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, at this point I've got a quick question. I don't know, maybe this is still theory. Uh, like, should I play e5 here? Uh, yes, he can. Yeah, I can play e5. I don't know, maybe he played first d6. Uh, maybe I... Uh, um, this maybe, game. The game, maybe the game was entered. Yeah, right. the, move order, the move order was different, I think, yeah. Because I think right. definitely play e5 here, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, if, if you can, definitely you, you can attack if that would push people, uh, your opponent back. But all right, in that case, let's move on. And this point, you played f4. Let me also say one thing which, like, the overall impression that I had about your games, right? I really love that you have this attacking style. That's great. You win a lot of games thanks to it, and I think that it is definitely... Yes in general, the right things for players to do. First of all, to master the art of attack, because that's what win games, uh, primarily. And only then you can uh, really start mastering like strategic chess, positional chess, and dive into the other more complex stuff. But having said that, you know, even though I like your attacking style, I still have to make one little note here that, you know, we shouldn't at the same time forget the basic principles. Right? Because they are still foundational. Yeah. And what I mean by the basic principles that, you know, in the opening, uh, we need to develop pieces, right? The, like yeah. the most straightforward task. And so whenever, instead of development, you play a pawn move, like F4, you should always know somewhere in the back of your mind that it could be wrong, you know, if yeah. you don't develop pieces. I knew that, but uh, because my opponents uh, did not play very well in openings, I thought that I can play a little bit unusual to start an attack and punish him. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Well, uh, this is an unfair technique. You use my own words against me, right? This is <laughs> right. from the how to be stronger opponents course. Yeah, then I yeah, can't argue right. anymore. Sure. <laughs> um, or an E5. Yeah, I mean, just just like I said earlier, I really love your attacking style. That's that's great. Here, yeah. D3. 
well, yeah, here I can see that you know, mentioned this in your comments that you, you kind of missed maybe this little bit awesome that you could have done right away. And uh, why did, yeah. didn't you play it? Because I don't want to release the tension. Ah, it, I see. It take D6. Mainly that was my reason, but... And I didn't see any... After E5, I didn't see any clear continuation for... Mm -hmm. I see, I see. Well, then re let me address this one by one. Uh, regarding releasing the tension, even though generally it's definitely correct and it's great that you know these concepts so well, overall, yes, we normally should keep the tension. But, you know, once again, attack is, th is the most important thing. Therefore, if you can attack, usually that's, that's the way to go. I mean, if you can release the tension but then continue attacking, that's still good. And you know the way, right? You focus your attention on the opponent's half of the board. Think what you can yeah. do there. You can go forward, attack something. And in this case, you can. So E takes D6. It does not just, it does not make Black's life easier. Like, you keep attacking him, keep pushing. And that is, and that is good. Yeah. And after E5, even though it's true that you cannot, like, checkmate him right away, but the good thing about this is that uh, you gain a lot of positional advantages. Now, your bishop is very active from here on the C4. Yes. Your knight has some great squares in the center. The f5 pawn restricts him on the king side. Like, I mean, positionally, you just got this really superior position. And even though you cannot win the game right away with straightforward attack, but this is a long-term advantage. You will be able to develop your attack in the middle game just as well. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, and that's also one interesting thing. I think that a lot of players actually miss that uh, while attacking, it's actually pretty difficult to win the game right away, like to, to checkmate your opponent. If your opponent is not like a total beginner, in the majority of the cases, it's impossible to literally checkmate him right away. Usually he can do something, sacrifice a pawn or worsen his position, but at least avoid like immediate disaster, avoid immediate checkmate. And that's okay, because after that you still gain some advantages and then you will continue playing a little bit slower, but you, you will still convert your advantage. Yeah, right. Because uh, you attack the king to gain a position, a stable positional advantages. Positional advantages. Exactly, exactly. So pleasant to talk to you. <laughs> uh, a, lot, a lot of people study my courses, but actually, rarely I see them uh, really quoting me <laughs> as precisely as you do it. Um, all right, great. And d3 is a fine move, of course. It's a development move, but... Uh, just if you would yeah. start the attack right away, maybe it would be even stronger. All right, let's see what happens next. Here at five. Uh -huh. Here I see that you added this no calculate till mate. And just like you said earlier, that's the course that you love the most. And therefore, I see the reason why you could find so good um, tactical shots. Yes, because I start uh, your courses by this course, not actually the beginner uh, sec uh, GM secrets. Uh-huh, uh -huh. I see, I see. That's why I, I studied it much more carefully than other courses. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's, that's nice. Actually, it made your style much more like attacking, aggressive, and tactical. Yeah. And F5, very good move. I'm, I'm sure a lot of players would not play it at this point because it's a pretty complex thing to do. It's, it's great that you could find it. And now you break up his defense. Break through in the center. Yeah, so far it's great. You keep attacking him. Then you bring the rook into play. Yeah, everything's just awesome. You sacrifice the piece, but now your attack is so strong and you force his king to stay in the center. Did you calculate like everything till the yes. end? Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, from f5 to maybe around rook g7, checking f8, uh, which I see that I have some discovery at least, and this king is too weak. That's why I stopped my calculation here at that point. Yeah. Exactly. That, that's that's right. Exactly correct. Because indeed, it's it's already clear that your attack is so powerful. Yes. And you play rook f1, bring the the last piece into play, also great. Let bishop d7, and now rook takes h7. Discover check, and then followed by queen g4. Well, what can I say? It's a brilliant game, really. Um, yeah. But I guess that you put this game on the first place in the games that you sent me on purpose, right? <laughs> Is this your best <laughs> game ever? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, not best game, but I really like this game. Because it's really... It's really... Uh, nice and just calculation and attack. 
Yeah, indeed. Well, the game is brilliant. I mean, uh, I'm I'm not even sure if Carlson has games like that. Uh, but, well, per- perhaps he has. He played a lot. But anyway, uh, the game is truly brilliant, and congratulations. It's very, very well done by you. Thank you. Th- thanks to you, I could play such games. Uh-huh, uh-huh. All right, but now let me ask you also if you have any questions or, or any problems that you have in chess, because... Uh, Certainly, alongside with this, with such brilliant games, you, you probably have some other games where you have some issues and questions and problems. Let me know about that, and we can think about how we can improve your game further. Uh, yes, I have some questions too. Of course, I have. Uh, I want to know what's your opinion about uh, critical moments in chess, because I have seen a lot of grandmaster use it in their games, and but. For me, it's not that I try to find the best move in every position. So, should we use it in our games or not? Oh, the critical moment is usually uh, the moment when you need to decide your plan. Just to give you an example, let's say if I come back to this position, right, in the opening stage. Uh, if at, at this point, sometimes players take some little bit more time than usual and just think about their next plan and what they're going to do. Because, for example, if you decide to play a 4 and then attack in the center, then you can take like 10 minutes to think about this position, but then you play a 4 and then you know that from there you're going to push one of these pawns forward and attack, right? So you can play your further moves quicker because you already decided what you're going to do. And then you will just decide whether you're pushed immediately or maybe you develop the mission first, but you already know your plan and you can play quicker. But you can also choose something else to do, right? You can decide that, okay, I'm going to play in a more classical style. I'm going to attack in the center. I'm going to play rook d1 and push the pawn to d4 and, like, attack in the center. Yeah, right. That case, yes. again, you, you can spend, like, 10 minutes thinking about, about this position, but then after rook d1, your next moves, again, you can play quicker. So he does something, and you play d4 already almost unthinkingly because that's your plan. So he recaptures, you obviously recapture, again, almost unthinkingly. And then even your future moves, it's pretty clear that the bishop will probably go to g5, right? So again, you can play the following move almost unthinkingly. I mean, a little bit of thinking you can put here, but, I mean... Uh, so yeah, your next right. moves are going to be natural. In that sense, sometimes uh, critical positions make sense, but overall, I would say, do not um, stress over this too much. It's not as as important, actually. You can just play you know, normal moves, uh, and um, I, I would even warn you a little bit against taking too much time to think about one position, because very often it's, it's just wrong. Very often it's more important, instead of thinking for 15 minutes in one position, trying to find the best move, very often it's much better to play average move without much thinking, but save your time and make sure that you will play more uh, seamless game without you know, getting into time trouble and then blundering a piece at the end. Yes, right. So, uh, my next question is, uh, uh, I, s- I saw your talk with uh, your one of your students uh, yesterday, two days ago, and you said him, Blitz games uh, fix uh, uh, badly his uh, style. I, uh, it's true, but from practical point of view and my own experience, I have seen, for example, Hikaru, that's play a lot of Blitz games, and uh, I want to know if it's really bad playing Blitz. For example, he can play more than 15,000 Blitz games. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm not saying that it's entirely bad and you should never do this, uh, but just like somebody says, it's like a cookie. It's okay to eat them, but just not too much, so th- there should be some healthy balance. Um, between, you know, cookies and the normal food, uh, such as Blitz. I mean, playing Blitz is okay, of course, and it's fun. Definitely, you can, you can do this. But if you play a lot, because Blitz can sometimes affect your style in, in a negative way. Because, for instance, in a Blitz game, like in this position, for example, which we just discussed right now, the move of 4, which you play in a game, is the best move to play in a Blitz game. Because it, it pre- prepares your immediate attack, Right. And in a blitz game for black, it's really difficult to withstand this kind of uh, difficult thing. Uh, having said that, like, objectively speaking, you know, if I'm absolutely objective, the rook d1 and d4, the classical plan, playing in the center, is probably stronger. And therefore, like, if you play f4 in blitz, it will work out. 
If you play this like in a tournament game, in a long time control game against a strong grandmaster, F4 could be actually wrong. Uh -huh. okay. so, so that's what I mean, like some things that work in Blitz will not work in a real over the board game against a strong opponent. But if you yeah. just play Blitz over and over again, you just develop this attitude that, okay, I'm gonna push, I'm gonna attack, I'm gonna sacrifice, but in Blitz it works almost always, right? Even incorrect sacrifice works in Blitz. Yeah, Just right. because your opponent does not have time to think and find the right defense. But again, in a, in a long time control game against a strong opponent, you know, in, an incorrect sacrifice may not work. So you yes, have to be true. more careful. And that, that's what I mean, that it's okay to play Blitz games, just to conclude, just maybe have some balance. And also balance them with a little bit of training games with a longer time control, where you play against computer and it a little bit brings you back into objectivity, into playing the right moves versus just playing the most aggressive moves, the most tactical moves. Yeah, about the strategical planning, you mean in real games mostly? Yeah, yeah, so that you, you play some Blitz games, but then again, like if you played, you know, one day you play just only Blitz games, you know, the other day maybe you can take a little bit of time and you can play one uh, game against computer training game with a little bit longer time control. And then yeah. go through this game with computer, and it will just show you these things like like that, which I'm just just saying. Yeah, and another thing is that uh, when I when I play Blitz game with uh, Grandmaster or some international master in internet, I realize that uh, actually there is a huge difference level between GM and IM, and that's that is GM are so fast just calculation their calculation is so fast uh, everything is so fast I want to know why why they are so uh, what did they do in their training uh -huh. yeah actually it's not that they calculate more and that in that regards I like the quote from Karchnoi one of the strong red masters uh, who said that uh, like the stronger your position understanding is the less you need to calculate because just you understand which moves should be better and which moves should not be good. So you don't even have to calculate the moves which your positional understanding tells you are not great. And that's basically how they play so so quick. Um, and they just automatic automate some skills, yeah? Yeah, first of all they automated already the right way of thinking, that, that's true. And secondly, yeah, so based on this automatic way of thinking they already know in many positions which moves should be good. So they don't have to think hard about it. So what should we uh, we do as, uh, for example, me as 2100 player to improve, to achieve that? Should we memorize uh, typical plans and uh, positional motives, for example, and uh, study classical games? Mm -hmm. Um, regarding your games, first of all, like I said earlier, I believe that you took the right approach. Initially, when you start studying chess, you need to play attacking openings, develop this attacking style, and it works out really well against players who are below 2000 rating. It, it works extremely well. You're going to win a lot of games just by you know, attacking them directly. But then, at the level that you already reached, it's time to add a positional understanding as well in, into picture. Uh, because in some other games of yours, um, let me try to find if I can notice this quickly. Maybe this one. Um, all right, let me go through the first moves rather quickly. More uh, theoretical moves. So at this position, for example. So here we played knight to f4. Yes, I prepared it before the game and it does not work. It uh -huh. didn't ah, work. So it was actually home preparation. Uh, yeah. Well, that that is okay, but again, like what you asked me earlier, why is the the grandmasters play quick quickly, right? Yeah. Um, it's because usually there are the basic positional ideas about chess, which says that in in the opening you need to develop pieces, castle, connect the rooks, the primary opening tasks. And yes, at times you can attack earlier, but the most classical strategy is that you got to do these three fundamental things first: castle, develop pieces, right, develop the bishop connect the rooks, meaning bring your queen out, and after that only, you normally start thinking about the attack. And yeah. so a lot of the times, grandmasters in a blitz games, he would just castle unthinkingly. He would not even think about these attacking ideas, because he knows that very often it's a premature attack and it's not going to work. 
Yeah, right. So that's but what I mean. But at least, uh, but at least, for example, in this game, it's complicated position. So it has some chances. Um. Yeah, but also talking about complications, there is a thing that, um, you know, once Karpov was asked about the style whether he chooses safest option or not. And he said that if he thinks that a certain move is the best, he will always play it, no matter if it's a simple move or it's a complicated move. But if there is a choice between several options, then he would choose a move according to his style. And that's what I can say about this thing as well. Like, complicating position just for the sake of complication is probably not a good idea. If the, if the move is the best, you got to play it anyway, right? Complicating position yeah, could right. be good if there is some reason for that. Or if you, you, you honestly believe that two moves are equal objectively and just one of them you love more because it's more complicated or more technical you may choose this yeah right yeah. Mm -hmm. or let me go just go through a couple more moves let's say through this game it was a pretty interesting game you know again uh, don't get me wrong I really love your attacking style I don't want that you get rid of this it's it's great you gotta keep it but just I would say that in addition to it you can add a little bit of more positional things as well to your style uh, because that's also one thing that a lot of players actually miss. They know that, you know, the purpose of chess is to checkmate opponent's king. And so they know that the plan in chess is to go after opponent's king, right? It looks like the most straightforward idea. And yeah. even though it's correct, of course, to some extent, but very often the immediate attack is not going to work. So you have to play positional. You have to accumulate some positional advantages, like better pawn structure, weaknesses in your opponent's camp, better king safety, putting your rook on an open file. Uh, having a bishop against the knight, things like that. And once you accumulate them more and more, at one point your position becomes so superior that then it just becomes really easy for you to develop your attack just because you're so much superior. Yeah, right. Uh, for example, th that's another thing which I'm talking about. So here you played queen h5 and knight g6 and went into this again attack on the king side, which makes some sense. I, I don't argue with this. Uh, but at the same time, I'm pretty sure a lot of players would go into the positional route here. They Maybe they would play h4 first to weaken the post structure, or maybe they would even just, you know, take on c6 simply, just to create those weaknesses. Instead of trying to checkmate the king directly, you know, they would just have this position where your opponent has a bunch of weak pawns. Almost all of them are weak, right? Yeah. And it's going to be a long-term problem for him. Even in an endgame, these old pawns will be weak. And then you can just finalize your development again. Play bishop p3, rook to c1, I mean, gradually bring your rook from h1 into play and just play a little bit slower and sort of then attacking all his weaknesses. His king is in the center. That's also a problem for him. Um, right. And um, the way that you try to attack always, uh, that's, I think, one of your problems because attack is good, you know, attack is right, but not always, right? You cannot yes. attack. You cannot try to attack with your every move at every situation. You have to still sometimes play positionally when immediate yeah. attack does not work. And in, in an opening especially. In an opening also very often you just need to finalize your development first. Yeah, right. Uh, and yeah, I have on. one more question. Uh, in evaluation, uh, I know that you suggest uh, we have two main factors. Uh, one material advantage and another activity. I want to ask about kink. King safety. Should, yeah, should be. King safety. King safety is also important, but usually the activity is a, is a primary factor anyway. Because even if your king is, king is weak, but your activity is good enough, usually you're, you're not in danger. Just because there is no way for your opponent practically to take advantage of you know, you know your king weakness. Yeah. Right. Th that's why. I mean, there are many factors. You know, um, they all play play its role. But practically, during a real game of chess, you don't have time to sit and think for half an hour and think about every, every little detail of a position. So you have to focus on a few most critical factors and based on them, make decision quickly. Yeah, right. And so that's why I'm, I'm suggesting that you focus on material and activity as two most critical factors. Yeah, right. And just like really this Yes, sorry for interrupting you, just like to, to give you an example, in this position, for instance, your king on f1 is weak, right? Like, generally yeah. speaking. 
Uh, but right now, there is no way black can attack it, and it's hard even to imagine how black will develop a successful attack against this king, right? Just because both of his pieces are still passive. Yeah, right, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else? Uh, no. Thank you very much for your advice. All right, all right, cool. One last thing that I wanted also to to bring here, I've seen one game, I think it was this one. Yeah, let me go right to the very end. Like, at this position? So, did you agree to the yeah. draw? <laughs> I agree, but I knew that this end game is, of course, white, black is better because of uh, good bishop on c4, bad bishop on g2, big pawns on a2, e4, and better king. But uh, at this point I have 24 minutes and I spent about 6 minutes and think about winning plan. And that was my, my mistake. I didn't go. And I didn't find the winning plan, so I agreed to the draw and waste 6 minute time. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see, but, I see. Uh, but I made a mistake, of course I made a mistake. Yeah, generally speaking, I um, absolutely I agree with everything you said. Uh, black has an advantage. Somebody like Carlson would assess this as winning for black, just, you know, <laughs> with no yes, mercy yeah. for white. You would just say that black is winning, clearly. It's time for white to resign. Um, because obviously you can't win quickly, but gradually you, you most probably can. Um, and that's also another... Uh, it kind of goes in, in the in the continuation to what we just discussed earlier, right? That sometimes you can attack, target opponent's king, you know, develop the strong attack right away and try to checkmate it. That's one strategy in chess. And it works, but not always. Uh, but there is also another strategy, right? Accumulating those different advantages. Just like if I sometimes bring up this analogy because people <laughs> can understand it easier. If you want to get a $1,000, uh, for instance, to earn that, you can try to somehow earn them in one go find certain uh, working task, some project that will give it to you like right away in one day. Or you can accumulate little by, by little. You can accumulate $100 10 times and you'll still be at $1,000 mark. So that's yeah, it's kind of a similar thing in chess. You can try to go after the opponent's skin and want to kill it right away in one go. Or you can accumulate different advantages and, and slowly but surely you will get to the same goal. And this strategy also works. And it works actually maybe even more often in chess just because checkmating opponent's king is, is, is actually difficult and um, more often than not it doesn't work as in, a, in such a straightforward way. Even in the games of Mikhail Tal, let's say, he's known for a lot of you know beautiful attacks but if you check all of his games you'll notice that like in he, he went for those deadly attacks maybe three games out of nine and the other games, he still played in a positional style just because there is there is no other choice, right? If your opponent does not make big mistakes, you cannot checkmate him. You have to accumulate these different advantages and uh, get in, make your position better and better gradually. Yeah, that's right. Uh, all right, Ali, then I'm happy that I could answer your questions and I hope that now you also can see the way for you clearly how to move forward. Once again, to summarize, I really love your attacking style. I would certainly recommend for everybody to do it this way only, to start with attacking openings, attacking style, and master this attacking style just like you did. And after that, to add a little bit of more positional also elements to your game, accumulating these advantages. Um, you can take a look at those more positional courses, such as the Grandmaster's Positional Understanding, the Grandmaster's Secrets, or an Endgame Expert. I don't know if you studied already them or, or not. Did you? Uh, yes, I studied them, but... Uh... And maybe not as carefully as, for example, calculate to mate. Yeah, and I can see that according to your style. So I think you can just take one of those courses and uh, study it also a little bit deeper. So that in addition to this, so to speak, uh, Tal style of playing, the very attacking style, you add a little bit of Carlson, a little bit of a, an oppositional technical style. And if you have these two things in place, then you will be able to bring your game to the next level. Yeah, right, yes. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, it was my pleasure talking to you. All the best. Bye-bye yes, for me now. Me too. Bye.